So here's the situation. You're currently in the market looking to buy a Thinanite laptop and you're just bombarded with a lot of options from different manufacturers uh, with both Intel and AMD processors. AMD just recently announced their 5008 series of CPUs for gaming laptops and the 5000U series for Thinanite devices. But the problem is that there isn't a single laptop that ships with a Ryzen 5U series or a Ryzen 7U series CPU, at least at the time of making this video. Now, on the other hand, the 4000U series are still really awesome options or alternatives uh, that pretty much dominate everything that Intel has to offer in their, uh, you know, CPU lineup for thin and light devices. Now, their latest offering is Tiger Lake, and we've covered a few laptops with those already. At this point, the Core i5-1135G7 and the Core i7-1165G7 are by far two of the most popular options. But with both being based on a four-core A-thread layout, you might be asking yourselves, which one should I pick? And is there a benefit going with one or the other? And that's what this video is all about, guys. I've got two identical Razorbook 13s, one of which has the Core i5 processor, the other one supporting the i7, and we're basically gonna put them against each other to see the performance differences and most importantly, battery life. And let me tell you, the results are certainly worth checking out. And they might actually have you second guessing your purchasing decision. So let's get to it. But first, a quick message from our sponsor. The Xtrify M42 RGB, what a fun mouse with five colorways, lightweight frame and just 59 grams with a swappable backplate to suit your grip style, the sensor, the easy cord, the smooth skates and driverless control for RGB and DPI is why you should check out the M42 RGB down below. All right, before we get into the benchmarks, let's take a quick look at the spec differences between the Core i5-1135G7 and the Core i7-1165G7. The naming scheme is ridiculous, but I had to like train myself to not make a mistake, so yeah. So first up, they're both quad-core CPUs with eight threads, but their base and boost frequencies are different. So the i5 starts at 2.4 gigahertz and features a single core boost up to 4.2. Uh, the i7 starts at 2.8 gigahertz and boosts all the way up to 4.7 gigahertz, which is a good 500 megahertz higher than the i5 on single core. Then there's the cache size. You're looking at eight megabytes on the i5 versus 12 megabytes on the i7. The number of execution units for the integrated XT graphics are different as well. You get 80 on the i5 and 96 on the i7. And the rest of the specs are pretty much the same, which includes the power operating range and the graphics frequency, which is at 1.3 gigahertz. Aside from that, both of these laptops are practically identical in terms of design features and even the battery capacity, except for the memory. So the i7 model comes with 16 gigabytes versus eight gigabytes on the i5 model. Uh, storage also remains the same at 256 gigabytes. And if you look at the price difference, the Core i7 model is $400 more than the Core i5 model. And this isn't even the razor tax a lot of you guys mentioned, since this kind of jump is something that we've seen on other Tiger Lake laptops. So yes, say hello to Intel tax. There's also one other small difference and that's in weight. Now, this not be a huge deal breaker, but the i7 model is actually 60 grams heavier than the i5. And you might be wondering what's causing that. I mean, it's not like the CPU is heavier than the, the other one, but uh, I think it might be because of the additional memory soldered onto the PCB, but um, yeah, it's just something to worth to keep in mind, something to keep note of. Either way, this is actually a great little laptop, guys. And if you wanna check out my review on the Razorbook 13, you can click right over here. I do wanna make a slight correction from that review. Some people pointed out that I didn't get the correct brightness level or the brightness value compared to everyone else. When I ran my display analysis test, I actually didn't realize that there was a setting under the display options that changes the brightness automatically depending on lighting situations. So I re-ran that test with that disabled and I got the expected 500 level. So yes, this is a very bright display and it's beautiful. Uh, so I do wanna take this time to sincerely apologize for making that mistake, but I do wanna thank you guys for bringing that up. Now, coming back to this video, some of you might be thinking to yourselves, Eber, there are thousands of laptops out there with Tiger Lake CPUs operating at different power levels. 
While I do agree with you on that, it's just impossible for me to go out and purchase every one of them and then test them out and give you a complete analysis. So this is probably the best apples to apples comparison that you'll be getting, considering they're both rocking the same identical specs right down to the interior design. So let's kick things off with frequencies over time. And under a full multi-core workload, you can see that the Core i7 starts pretty strong at just a tad over four gigahertz, but a few minutes into the test, it reduces down between 3.2 and 3.6 gigahertz. That's pretty much expected due to Intel's PL1 and PL2 power limits. Now, when we switch gears to the Core i5 CPU, it starts at 3.7 gigahertz for a few seconds, which is a lot lower than the i7, but it actually maintains a higher average frequency throughout this 10 minute test. It isn't much at an average of just over 75 megahertz, but it's still certainly there. What that means is in quicker synthetic tests, the Core i7 CPU will definitely be faster because of its slightly higher and slightly longer burst speed. But in longer tests like rendering our scene, these two CPUs could be very much evenly matched and the i5 might actually come out ahead of the i7, uh, even in cases where there aren't any memory or cache bottlenecks. So let's dive in a bit further into this. At first, I thought higher temperatures might have been causing the i7 to settle on lower speeds, but that wasn't the case at all. It was running above 70 degrees Celsius compared to the i5, which was averaging around 68 to 69 degrees. But both of those are super low compared to the 90 plus on other thin and light laptops that we've been seeing. So thermal throttling isn't playing a factor here. Looking at overall power gives a better understanding about what's happening here. Basically, Razer has capped both these chips at a long duration power limit of 20 watts. And that causes a bit of an issue for the i7 since it obviously needed to fluctuate its clock speeds a bit more than the i5 to avoid chugging down more than 20 watts. And as a result, its overall average speeds end up being lower. You see, Intel struggled to move their low power chips beyond a quad core architecture. So both the i5 and the i7 have the same layout with four cores and eight threads. But the i7 has more cache and a larger GPU, both of which need more power. So that means the more efficient CPU, which is the Core i5 processor in this case, will hit higher average frequencies when both have identical power limits, like Razer implemented on the Book 13. Some of that could have been taken care of if Razer had just given the i7 just a little bit more juice to play around with, but uh, I just don't know why they haven't since there's obviously thermal headroom to spare. Now looking back, this is actually something that we've seen from Intel CPUs, especially in the laptop market, it isn't Razer specific either, and it would impact other laptops as well. Razer was actually the only brand who was willing to let us test these on two identical laptops. Now, if you look on the desktop side, we can see something similar with the 10850K, which can manage to beat the 10900K in a lot of situations. Now, to hammer this home just a bit more, let's take a look at Handbrake Transcode, which absolutely pounds the cores and local cache. Here, you can see that the i5 is actually quite a bit faster than the i7 to the tune of about 100 megahertz, though in some cases it's above 150 megahertz. Meanwhile, temperatures are kept really well in check with Razer's vapor chamber cooling system. I mean, seeing a max of just over 70 degrees is pretty incredible. And yes, that power limit sticks to 20 watts, so you can see how that i7 is just craving for a bit more juice so it can stretch its legs. Since every application needs are different, especially when it comes to all core loads, expect some really interesting results. I also noticed that as I was testing the Book 13 with the Core i7 CPU, the fans just kept ramping up even when I was doing lightly threaded tasks compared to the i5, which was just practically dead silent. So if acoustic performance is something that you value, uh, choosing the i5 might be a better option. So now that you're aware of how these CPUs behave, let's take a look at some numbers. As usual, we made sure to run our usual suite of tests, and I also made sure to run um, both these laptops on the highest performance mode to get the best results. Starting off with Cinebench, and I need to explain this one right away. You see, every run got a huge amount of variance, which is normal for Cinebench, but the i7 was just really all over the place. On average, it was still slower than the i5. In Blender, things were neck and neck, with very little difference between the two CPUs. But in Handbrake, that 100 to 150 megahertz ends up really paying some benefits over a longer test, so much so that the i5 is the clear winner here. Even with Adobe Premiere Pro, I was expecting the extra EUs along with hardware encoding to favor the Core i7, but again, clock speeds are key here. I should also mention that even though the i7 does have more GPU execution units, unlike CUDA cores, 
they aren't used here, but rather it's the QuickSync stage that's used and that's the same on both the i7 and the i5. Now, if we switch over to single core performance, the Core i7 takes lead with all of our lightly threaded benchmarks. But to be honest with you, it isn't a noticeable difference. I mean, on paper, sure, it's a few seconds faster here and there, but in reality, when you're handling these machines on a day-to-day -day basis, they both feel equally responsive. I was hoping for that extra 500 megahertz turbo clock on the i7 would make a bit of a difference, but I was wrong. That i5 is still putting up a really good fight, guys. And yes, the i5 is faster, but is that extra money worth it? Not the way I see it. But gaming performance is another matter altogether. Keep in mind, both these laptops aren't geared to deliver high frame rates, but rather acceptable performance for casual gaming in some basic titles. Either way, I was just curious to find out if there was a difference. And you know what? There was. At 1080p, you can get some playable frame rates with both these laptops, but the XE graphics engine with 96 execution units on the Core i7 CPU delivers a noticeable improvement in performance compared to the Core i5. We also can't forget that the i5 has less cache and system memory to pull onto. At least in this situation, the i7 is the clear winner right across the board. The last thing that we have to look at is battery life, and it's pretty much the same since both have the same number of cores and same operating wattage. The i5 does have a slight lead, but it's not enough to make a huge difference. So to sum this all up, both the i5 and the i7 have their strengths and weaknesses. The i5 takes the edge in multi-core performance and price. The i7 runs away with gaming and it delivers really good lightly threaded performance, which is super important for a lot of general use cases. But again, it costs a whole lot more. But the main problem is that a lot of these i5 laptops come paired with just eight gigabytes of memory, which can't be upgraded. And while I didn't encounter any issues when I was testing it, it's actually a pretty big limitation, especially when you just ignore that factor or you can't ignore that factor in 2021 because everything just seems to be taking up a lot of memory. So if you can find an i5 1135G7 with 16 gigabytes of RAM, that's the configuration that I would personally get because A, the performance is pretty good, and B, you're probably gonna end up saving a lot of money instead of going with the i7. So on that note, thank you so much for watching. Uh, I hope you were able to take away something from this video. Let me know what you guys think about the results. Has it surprised you? Uh, yeah, I'm just curious to know. And I'll talk to you guys in the next one, Spend Responsibly.